With the preliminaries out of the way from the previous videos, now we're ready to get into the calculus of variations itself. And this, this chapter, chapter two, is really the heart of the entire subject. It is actually all the mathematics that's necessary to solve and address all the applications and problems throughout the remainder of the book. So this is really the heart of the subject, variational methods, in terms of the mathematical methods and so forth. And you can see the outline here. The first section that we'll start on in this video is really the foundation for everything that we're going to do throughout chapter two and, and therefore the rest of the book. All of the rest of the sections in chapter two then are going to be dealing with additional situations or special cases or scenarios that we need to be able to deal with such as incorporating constrained functionals and things like that. But the majority of the methodology is going to be contained in this very first section as you'll see. So if you think about calculus at its most basic level Calculus is the mathematics of change. In the differential calculus context, what we're looking at is the change of a function as we move from point to point. So I have a function, f of x or u of x, and I'm looking how at different x's, how does that function change? I'm looking at slopes and so forth to determine the behavior and how that function changes. So a function, say u of x, u being the dependent variable, x being the independent variable, is such that the dependent variable takes on a unique value for each value of x. You put in a value of x and out of u of x comes a value. That's the value of u for that particular x. And like I said, we can look at slopes and things to determine the behavior of that function. In the variational calculus context, it addresses changes in functionals as we move from function to function. So rather than a change of a function as we move from one point to another, we're looking how a functional changes as we move from one function u of x to another function u of x. So very similar idea, but different application. So one way to think about a functional is it's a function of functions. So a function and you put in a value, you get out a value. A functional, you put in an entire function, say u of x, and you take the definite integral and out comes a value. That's the functional. So it's a function of another function. More specifically, a functional is a definite integral whose integrand contains some unknown function and typically some of its derivatives. So again, it's this definite integral of some integrand, we'll call it capital F, involving our function u of x, and we don't know u of x. Once we know u of x, we could evaluate the definite integral, get the value of the functional, and we'd be done. But we're looking for the function itself, that u of x, that minimizes or maximizes our functional. So a functional will be denoted by a capital I. It's a function of u, which is our dependent variable, which itself is a function of x, which is our independent variable. So again, in that way, it's a function of another function. We'll always use square brackets to indicate the arguments, those functions as arguments. So thinking back to our three motivational examples from chapter one, we had the travel time t, we had the total energy e for the Fermat's principle of optics for the shape of the liquid drop and for the river crossing trajectory problem. So those were the functionals, t and e, again we use capitals, which were functions of the u of x and the u of r. So once again, the differential calculus is then the calculus of functions, whereas variational calculus is the calculus of functionals. You're gonna see a lot of similarities but you will see some differences. I'll build on the similarities and the analogies to help us understand, have some intuition, carry forth the intuition that we have from differential calculus and variational calculus. But of course, we'll have some different notation and some things will be indeed different. So we're gonna look in this chapter at the mathematical aspects of obtaining those stationary functions. They might be extremums, but at least stationary functions, which we'll talk about more uh, later in, in this section. And then once we have these techniques in place, we could go back to chapter one and solve those functionals, determine those shapes and the paths and so forth that would minimize the functionals that we had in those examples in chapter one. And the breadth and scope of the applications of variational methods is, is truly remarkable. The, if you just look through the table of contents page through the book and you see the wide variety of subject areas, again, all the way from classical mechanics to relativity theory and, and fluid mechanics and so many other subjects can be encapsulated very concisely in a unified variational principle, this Hamilton's principle that I've mentioned a couple times before. 
We'll start by treating a functional of one function. So there'll be one dependent variable, u, and one independent variable, usually x. And in later sections, we'll extend it to situations where you have more independent variables, so multi-dimensions, more dependent variables, and higher order derivatives and constraints and, and so forth. But, but again, the core approach and the core method will encapsulate in this context for a single dependent variable of a single independent variable. So let's look at functionals of one independent variable. Now you may feel a little bit like our friend here uh, as we're going through this. You'll feel a bit precarious at times. You'll feel like you're not quite sure what I'm talking about. And the reason is because we're translating from one language to another. And for any of you that have learned a different language from your native tongue, you know how difficult that is at first. At first you translate every word back and forth. It's very tedious, very cumbersome, and you really don't feel very comfortable with it. You do feel like you're kind of precarious in using that second language. As you get more comfortable with it, more used to it, you can start to think in that new language and you can start to use vocabulary, the notation, uh, and so forth of that second language. So that second language now is variational methods and variational notation. But as of now, the only language we know is that of differential calculus. So we're going to have to use differential calculus terminology, nomenclature, notation, in order to express the ideas and do the derivations for variational methods. But once we're comfortable with the variational notation, we can do everything from that point of view. So I'm going to walk us through this in the next couple of videos. And just trust me, we'll get there in the end. But you will feel a little precarious. So, you know, hang on tight and trust me is uh, what I would ask you to do right now. Okay, so let's think about the variation of a function. I know what a function is, that's u of x, f of x. What is the variation of a function? So let's discuss that first. So we have a generic functional, i of u of x. And for now, that is a definite integral in one independent variable x. And the integrand, we'll call it capital F, is a function of x u and u prime. So the independent variable, the dependent variable, and its first derivative. We'll extend it to more general cases later on, but for now this is the, the case that we'll look at. And it turns out that this encompasses a wide variety of scenarios and situations. In fact, all three of the motivational examples that we did in chapter one. We have boundary conditions. So at x0, u is u0. And at x equals x1, u is u1. So we know the values of u at the two endpoints of our domain, and we're looking for the function u of x that gives us an extremum, or otherwise being a stationary function of our functional. There are other types of boundary conditions that we can impose, and we'll talk about those later in the chapter, but these are essential, or sometimes known as Dirichlet boundary conditions. So you'll often hear me say fixed boundary conditions. The values of u are fixed at the particular endpoints. And again, we're looking for the stationary function of our functional i of u of x. All right, so again, this is gonna seem a little cumbersome because I'm gonna be going back and forth between variational and differential calculus, but bear with me. I'm actually gonna go through the derivation of the primary equation known as Euler's equation three times. And so we'll kind of work our way up to the final form, which is the variational notation form of that derivation. So trust me as we walk through this sequence of videos to get where we, where we need to go. All right, so what I'm looking for is this function u of x. I don't know what u of x is. I'm looking for it. So in true calculus fashion, if I have a function, I want to know how it behaves at a particular value of x, I'll look at a value close by, an x plus a dx, and I can get slopes and so forth and determine kind of the behavior at that point. So in an analogous way, we're going to define another curve, call it u hat of x, that's close to u of x. So I don't know what u of x is, but I'm going to imagine there's this other curve, u hat of x, that's close by. And we'll talk about what we mean by close by in, in a moment. Now because they're close together, we can express the difference between the two in terms of a series expansion. I'm going to use this parameter epsilon. It's a small parameter. We'll use that to show the difference between u of x and u hat of x. So the order epsilon term highlighted here in red would be partial u partial epsilon when epsilon is equal to zero times that small parameter epsilon. So it's an order epsilon correction. That's the, the difference. And then the next term would be order epsilon squared and then order epsilon cubed. But because epsilon is tiny, 
epsilon squared, epsilon cubed, ex, epsilon to the fourth would be smaller, smaller, and smaller. So when the limit as epsilon goes to zero, we can neglect those higher order terms. So the sense in which these two functions are close is in the sense that their norms are close. So if I take the norm of one function, I get a number, take the norm of the other function, get a number. If those numbers are close, then the functions are quote unquote close. Now we know what it looks like when we see it intuitively when you graph it, these two functions are, are close. You'll notice at the endpoints, we know the value of u at the endpoints at x0 and x1. So the both functions will satisfy those known boundary conditions. Now this order epsilon term is what we're gonna focus on. That is the variation of u. So it's the change from one function to another, from this function to another. We'll denote it by delta u, the variation of u. So delta u is partial u partial epsilon evaluated when epsilon is equal to zero times epsilon. That is that second term in the expansion, the order epsilon term in the expansion. So let's introduce another function, eta of x, and that's gonna be the partial u partial epsilon. So that's this right here. So that's just gonna simplify the writing of these expressions. So u hat is equal to u plus epsilon eta. So that's that ep order epsilon term just expressed in a little more concise fashion. And of course, again, you have the order epsilon squared terms and, and so on. Epsilon here is a small parameter. It's a constant value for each function. But as I go from one function to another, epsilon is gonna change. So epsilon equals something for one function, equals something else for another function. So changes in epsilon represent changing from one function to another. Now we know the values of eta at the endpoints, they're zero. Again, the values at the endpoints we know, and so the difference between the two curves, u and u hat, are zero, because they both satisfy those end conditions. So the values of eta, at the endpoints are zero. We'll use those later on. So now the difference between these two functions, u hat and u, is just equal to epsilon eta, and we'll write that in variational notation as delta u. So once again, we're kind of doing this translation between differential and variational notation. So this is differential, and this is variational. In the third of our three derivations, we won't need the differential form anymore, and we'll just focus on the variational notation. But in the meantime, to use concepts from the differential calculus that we're familiar with, we'll be using these epsilons and etas to kind of help us out along the way. So again, delta u then is the variation of u of x as we move from curve to curve. This sounds very familiar. This is very much like differential calculus, where dx, like delta u, is the differential of x from point to point. So how does the function u of x behave as I go from one value of x to another value of x. Okay, so let's look at the functional derivative. We know what a partial derivative is. A partial derivative tells us if I have a function f of x, y, z, and I wanna know how does that function behave in a particular coordinate direction, say. So I can use the partial derivative, partial f, partial x, for example, to tell me how does that behave, how does that, what's the rate of change of that function in the x direction. So that's the partial derivative of f with respect to x or y or z. So we're gonna do an analogous operation in variational calculus. We're gonna call this the functional derivative or the Frege derivative. We'll denote it by delta i, delta u. So basically it's the variation of the functional i with respect to the function u of x that we're looking for. Okay, so let's express di d epsilon when epsilon is equal to zero. So from the definition of the derivative, that's the limit as epsilon goes to zero, of i of u hat minus i of u, so the value of the functional for each of those two functions, u hat and u, divided by epsilon. Well, u hat, that's just u plus epsilon eta from our previous expansion. So let's write out these functionals then. So here's i of u, it's the integral of f of x u u prime. All right, so that's just the, the functional that we were given, i of u. Now for u hat, we have i of u plus epsilon eta. So instead of u, we have u plus epsilon eta, u prime plus epsilon eta prime. This term we can write as a Taylor series because epsilon is small. So this term will remain the same. So let's write that first integral using a Taylor series. So we have the value of f at x u u prime 
plus the order epsilon terms. This is like a 2D Taylor series. And so that would be epsilon eta partial f partial u plus epsilon d eta dx partial f partial u prime. And then of course the higher order terms. But now look what happens with this and this integral. They cancel out because they're both just integrals of f of x u and u prime. Then the epsilons cancel in these terms. And so I'm just left with di d epsilon being the integral of eta times partial f partial u plus d eta dx times partial f partial u prime. So let's focus on this second term. And the reason is as follows. In the first term, I have eta. I actually don't care about eta. It's just a construct to enable me to do this derivation. So if I could factor it out of the rest of the integrand, that would be helpful for reasons that you'll see in a moment. But in order to do that, I have to get the derivative off of this d eta dx. So that's eta prime. So if I could turn this d eta dx into an eta, then I could factor out the etas, and you'll see why that is helpful. OK, so let's focus on this second term. Well, that's where the integration by parts comes in. So this was reviewed in chapter 1. And it says that the integral of p dq is p times q evaluated at the endpoints minus the integral of q dp. Now, how you decide what the, what the p and the dq are is as follows. The dq is the part from which we want to remove the derivative. So in this case, that's the a to prime dx. It's the d eta dx. So that when I integrate that to get q, it's just eta, which is what we want. And then the p is the rest of that term. So in this case, that's partial f partial u prime. So we're going to move the derivative off of the eta and on to the partial f partial u prime. So then we put it all back together. We have this term evaluated at the endpoints from the integration by parts. That's the, that's the p times q evaluated at the endpoints. So here's q and here's p. And then this first term is partial f partial u times eta. We didn't do anything with that term. And then this second term is now d dx, well, minus d dx, of partial f partial u prime times eta. So you see we've been able now to remove the eta out of the rest of the integrand. And we have the integral of something here in square brackets with no epsilons, no etas, times eta. So let's take a look at this first term. It's eta times partial f partial u prime evaluated at the endpoints x0 and x1. Well, we said when we defined eta of x that at the endpoints of our domain, it's equal to 0, because I know the value of u at the endpoints, so I can fix the u and the u hat to be the same. So eta is 0 at those two endpoints. So this first term actually vanishes. And we're just left with the integral of the thing in square brackets times eta dx. Now, how does that help us? Well, let's call the thing in square brackets, let's call that the functional derivative. So that's the functional derivative that we were looking for. So it's partial f partial u minus d dx of partial f partial u prime. That is the functional derivative delta i delta u, the variation of the functional i with respect to variations in the dependent variable, the function u. It's the rate of change of the functional with respect to changes in the function rather than the rate of change of the function with respect to changes in the value of x. So then this is our functional derivative. Now you notice I said, well, let's set that equal to 0. I don't know that yet. I haven't proven that yet. But I'm just using my intuition. I'm, so just like in differential calculus, take the derivative, set it equal to 0. That determines stationary points. So here to find stationary functions, maybe I do the same thing. So I'm just going to intuitively suppose that this is indeed the case. And it turns out that that is true, and we'll prove that that is true in the next video.